sorry yeah mm -hmm. shall i start sir yes shilpa madam we are live uh yeah so i welcome all of you for uh, this session of master class uh, Dr. Jay is uh, operating at Pune and uh, he has joined us from Pune. So uh, till I think uh, six o'clock, we were not sure whether we would be doing, but Jay is Jay. So he decided that uh, once he has fixed it, he should not change his mind. So we are here amongst all of you uh, for this uh, special master class. Uh, it's special because I have received a couple of uh, questions, which is the same question as to how Sir is doing what he is doing, taking masterclass at 10 in the night after a long day. And today, I think uh, um, he has taken the trophy by traveling and then operating in Mumbai, that general perforation and here at Pune, operating on two cases, seeing OPD. So, yeah, uh, your inputs on this, sir. What is the secret for your uh, success or uh, how are you able to do it consistently? See, today is the fifth day of my fasting, okay? So, it is sometimes a gift. Uh, I think uh, I have been on water and fruits without salt since the last five days now because of Navratri, okay? So, I think it is all in the mind, you know? Otherwise, uh, on a normal day, I can't resist food like this. But uh, I think it's a part of the mind. And if, if, if your mind is detached from most of the things, you know? I think you will be able to do very well in life. But I could be wrong, okay? This is based on my limited experience. Yeah. Shall we go ahead with the talk, sir? Yes, please. So, I'll just start with the screen sharing, Shilpa, madam. Please stay. Yes, sir. Uh, the screen is visible, right, Shilpa, madam? No, not yet. Okay, now... Yeah. Can you see what I have written on the screen? A signature has been done by me. No. Is there a lag in the net? Is it? Yeah. Now it is seen. Yes. Okay. I do not know if there is a lag, madam. I am unable to understand it from here. Okay. Yeah. You can just continue. Okay. So, I, I can continue, right? There is no problem in that, right? Uh, yeah. You, you Can you just write uh, something on the screen? So, I have written normal responders on the screen. Yeah. You can go ahead. Okay, fine. So, uh, guys, welcome. See, today we are going to be discussing only normal responder stimulation protocols and this normal responder stimulation protocols for patients who do not wish to undergo IPM. So, basically, when we try and speak of normal responders, we are trying to include people who have a normal AMH and obviously a normal semen analysis because that is very important for people to try without IV, right? And you should also have normal and patent alluvial tubes. Okay, these are your pre pre typical prerequisites. So basically, we are trying to look at stimulation at any AMH more than 1.5, less than 8. Okay, and we are also trying to look at patients who are having an antral follicle count of. We have lost you, I think. There is some internet problem. Yeah, sorry, Dr. Shilpa. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. So, I'll again start the uh, screen sharing. Just tell me if the screen can be seen or not, okay? There is a lag when you speak, when you share the screen. Okay. Just let me know if I am audible, madam. Yes, you are. Okay. 
So we are trying to look at patients who are having an antral follicle count of between 6 to 12. Now, sometimes people will say that, no, it is not 6 to 12. Sometimes people will say it is between 8 to 12. Some people will say it is between 10 to 14. All these things are considered to be actually the same as far as this entire protocol for normal responders is concerned. Okay. It is important that after we satisfy this criteria, okay, what is the type of protocol? So this is your inclusion criteria. These are all your inclusion criteria and you are only going to do this. Okay. Now, whenever you are stimulating a patient either for timed intercourse, that is ovulation intercourse with natural intercourse or ovulation induction with IUI. These are predominantly the two things which you will be end up doing as far as this entire protocol is concerned. Okay. Now, what is important for all of us to understand is which protocol to use in this type of situation. Should it be letrozole alone? Should it be letrozole or extended letrozole? Or should it be letrozole plus HMG? So the answer is very simple. Okay. It is based on what is your target. So if your target is monofollicular, all right, or your target is multifollicular. When I talk of multifollicle, your multifollicle is basically two to four follicles, monofollicle is one follicle. All right. In both these situations, if your target for a particular patient, be it natural intercourse or be it IUI, if it is going to be simply monofollicular development, then your standard letrozole protocol, which we have shared multiple times, is going to be your protocol of choice which includes 2.5 mg to be given in the night for five days, starting from the second day or the third day of the cycle, going on till the sixth or the seventh day of the cycle. All right. If the patient is weighing more than 80 kg, it's again very simple. You can give 2.5 mg twice in a day for five days. All right. Same day two, day three, up till day six, day seven. Usually, when you do this entire standard letrozole protocol, what is going to happen in the standard letrozole protocol is that your ultrasound, your primary first ultrasound is going to happen between day 9 or day 10. And when you do a day 9, day 10 scan, you are going to have an 18 to 20 millimeter leading follicle. If along with this, the endometrial thickness is more than 7.5 millimeters or 7 millimeters, let's just take it that way. The simplest thing is to give an HCG 10,000 trigger. Okay. This HCG 10,000 trigger is then given and the patient is asked to have timed intercourse for the next five days or the patient is asked to have IUI after 48 hours or 40 hours. And after that, you are going to give luteal phase support in the form of any progesterone gel. Okay. This is your standard. No need to change this. No need to go and deviate from this. All right. Shilpa Madam, I hope I am audible at this point in time. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, fine. So this is your absolutely straightforward standard letters all protocol. There are going to be certain instances in this, okay, in your normal responders. Now remember, because they are normal responders, they are going to respond extremely well to your standard letters all protocol. Okay, that is the reason why they are normal responders. Okay, they are going to respond very beautifully. So this entire protocol which you follow, even if you don't desire, it is going to give you an approximate success rate of 10 to 12 percent in every attempt that you are doing this protocol as long as these criteria, as long as the inclusion criteria is met down very nicely. All right. Obviously, there are going to be certain instances where you are going to have patients who are going to be resistant to this dose of standard letrozole. Now, only when they are resistant to this dose, you can use extended letrozole. Okay, in this type of a response. Otherwise, reserve that extended letrozole as we have told. What does extended letrozole mean? You give 2.5 mg. Instead of 5 days, you are giving it approximately for 10 days, never beyond 10 days. So it's going to start from day 2, day 3, and it is actually going to continue till day 10, day 11. All right. The same thing. If the patient is more than 80 kgs, your dose of 2.5 mg is going to become twice for 10 days, but nothing beyond that. Okay, nothing beyond that because beyond that, more than 10 days of stimulation of extended letrozole might result in a poor endometrium. So just keep that in mind. It will cause a poor ET. That is something which you don't want. After the extended letrozole is given for 10 days, it is the same. You do an ultrasound, which will typically happen on day 11, day 12. 
the lead follicle will be 18 to 20 millimeters. ET should be more than 7.5. You give an HCG 10,000 trigger and the luteal phase support is with progesterone gel as usual, which is initiated after 40 to 48 hours. Very, very simple. All right. No need to even calculate this thing. So then comes the next question that, okay, I'm very happy with this entire thing. And this has resulted in a good monofollicular development. And I am very safe. I don't have risk of twinning. I don't have risk of OHSS. You know, there is no risk of twinning. There is no risk of OHSS. So then why should I use a multifollicular development at all? Why should I do that in the first place in a patient who is a normal responder? So the answer to that question is very simple. See, as and when your practice advances, as and when you become more and more famous as a fertility consultant, what is going to happen to you is there is going to be a huge set of these normal responder patients who are going to come to your OPD knocking doors and telling you that, look, sir, already letrozole has been tried on me. Already somebody has given letrozole on me and I have already taken 10 cycles of letrozole. Now I am no longer wanting to take that letrozole alone. I want something which is going to enhance my success rates and I'm okay as far as twinning is concerned. Okay. The risk of twinning is any which way is less than 5% in this, but I'm okay with a multifollicular stimulation. Now, should that be your criteria for a multifollicular stimulation? The protocol, which is absolutely standardized is letrozole along with HPHMG, 150 international units, both together for a period of seven days. Now, when you do this, the obvious question is why seven days and why not eight to 10 days? Why seven days? Who standardized it? Which guideline mentions it? So no guideline mentions this. But usually what is going to happen is if you do this protocol from approximately day two, day three, and this goes on for seven days. So when it goes on for approximately day eight, day nine, when the patient comes back for an ultrasound, which is typically on day 9 or day 10, you are going to have two or three lead follicles. And these two or three lead follicles are going to be between 18 and 20 millimeters. So the obvious question is, I understand all these things. What is the need to add letrozole? I want to give HMG alone. All right. The reason why you give letrozole is because when you give letrozole, the E2 stays low. And when the E2 stays low, that E2 peak, which is going to occur in order to cause the LH surge, that doesn't really occur. Okay. You require, if you study the normal menses, there is an E2 peak, which occurs. And only after this E2 peak, there is something called as an LH surge. Okay. For the LH surge to occur, for this LH to surge, this E2 peak is absolutely mandatory. What happens is if you give HMG alone, 150 international units uncontrolled, the follicle is going to become 15 millimeters on probably the sixth day of stimulation and it is going to cause a premature LH surge. Okay. Now, so again, the next question can come. Are so what? You just add an antagonist on the day seven. Why to give letrozole along with this? But please remember, if you add an antagonist, okay, it is again going to reduce your implantation. Okay. That is because antagonist itself is going to affect the endometrium. As a result of this, in order to negate this, you are adding letrozole. This letrozole doesn't allow this E2 to occur. So there is no LH surge. And when this patient comes to you at 18 to 20 millimeters, you can give again the same standardization, HCG 10,000 trigger. Now you have allowed two to three follicles to rupture. This two to three follicles, which rupture causes two to three corpus luteum to form. But please remember, when you have added HMG, what happens is this LH surge is little abnormal. Okay. And because this LH surge is little abnormal, the two or three corpus luteum which are formed are slightly defective. As a result of this, you require very good luteal phase support in this as well. And the luteal phase support is going to be very standard. Your progesterone gel 8% twice in a day for the next 14 days. You can supplement this with IUI. You can supplement this with natural intercourse cycles. No matter what you want to do, you can standardize it in that manner. Obviously, a lot of people, before I conclude this, are going to ask me a question that, okay, this is very good and we are very happy with what you just now taught. But what is the role of adding any form of adjuvants in a patient who is a normal responder? So the commonest adjuvants which people are going to talk about and people are going to add. So I will write down all the adjuvants very, very quickly and I will probably give you a one, one minute guideline on what is the role of these adjuvants. Okay. Because that is something which is very important 
everybody likes to give adjuvants okay please remember that there are very few who will not like to give adjuvants so first adjuvant which i will start with is ecospring 150 international units okay for a normal responder who desires ovulation intercourse ovulation induction with natural intercourse or ovulation induction with iui you can easily give this there is absolutely no problem okay very very commonly people are going to ask apart from this what other antioxidants do you give to the female so do you give ultra coq do you give any dhea to these do you give any vitamin d do you give any folic acid to all these women look vitamin d and folic acid are absolutely no problems you can give okay both these guys ultra coq and this thing are highly highly debatable so i try to avoid these things a lot of combination multivitamins okay a lot of combination increase the quality of the oocytes again highly 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 debatable okay we'll probably take a specific master class on it so if you ask me i avoid this i avoid this i avoid this in fact i hardly even give vitamin d folic acid is a maybe okay if the patient wants they can take ecosprin can be standardized you can give ecosprin in all these patients a lot of people also ask about three or four other adjuvants which i will obviously now mention and that is arginitric sachet okay sildenafil this is the other commonest adjuvant which people normally like to give to all the patients okay i don't give this is just my opinion i don't give any of them because they have got absolutely no role because it has been proven without a doubt that when you are trying to give anything to a normo responder remember one thing a normo responder is called a normo i mean a normal responder is called a normal responder because we expect this particular bunch of individuals to form a normal we expect these guys to form a normal oocyte as long as a normal oocyte is being delivered it has a high chance of forming a euploid embryo under correct stimulation okay obviously it is not 100% but the chances are high and this euploid embryo will allow for excellent endometrial to embryo crosstalk and it will give rise to excellent implantation okay which is why they are considered to be a normo responder so just keep that in mind as a result of which i mentioned what i mentioned okay with this i finish the basic of stimulation for these particular subset of individuals who are going to require okay uh, stimulation on an almost day to day basis in our routine ivf practice and because they require so much stimulation i think simplified and standardized protocols are the answer rather than providing confusing protocols which people may or may not follow all right but of course i am happy to answer questions for the next 5 minutes yeah so uh, what is the commonest uh, reason that you are doing ovulation induction in these cases of uh, normal responders is, is it unexplained infertility mild endometriosis so the most common answer yeah the most common answer in this is one unexplained infertility which is the pathogenic cause second is when people want this fertility planning see there are so many people who are otherwise normal responders but they want to become pregnant in a particular year okay they want to try for conception let's say somebody wants to conceive in 2024 right so you can't really tell them go try naturally for 6 months of course you can ask them to do that but just giving that adjuvant letrozole okay is something which is so good you can program their cycle for them you can allow them to have timed intercourse on a number of particular number of days okay so that they can plan their work life balance accordingly and it can also give rise to excellent pregnancy outcomes okay uh, so how many cycles of letrozole you use uh, alone how many this is good six is good yeah six is good and what is the maximum dose of letrozole you have used 5 mg is maximum 5 mg yeah 5 mg see any prolonged dose beyond that 7.5 mg 10 mg all these things can give rise to a thin endometrium madam because the estrogen suppression is very high yeah 
So, do you use uh, clomiphene citrate at all in uh, these cases? No. In normal. No. No. But there are a lot of people who use it and are very happy with it. But I am talking and I am discussing what I am using the most commonly in my practice. Okay. Okay. So, uh, are, are steroids as adjuvants, I mean, in uh, normal. No role. Hardly any role. Frankly, no role. And uh, if we are doing only letrozole cycles, so do you still recommend giving uh, luteal phase support? I think we discussed See, this. We discussed this. I completely understand there are papers which state, which which clearly state that, okay, there is no role of giving luteal phase support. But they never mentioned that if you give luteal phase support, your pregnancy rates would go down. Okay. They never really mentioned that. Fine. So with the HMG 150, so you use only the same dosage throughout uh, the seven days. So same dosage. You... There is no re reason to step it up. Okay. Okay. So in uh, normal responders, uh, uh, even for IUI, you never cross 150 units of HMG, is it? No, because you don't want more than two to three follicles, madam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I think See, the uh, commonest question which people would ask is, oh, you know what? I have seen that follicle is 18 millimeter, but endometrium is 6 millimeter. What to do? Very good. Go through our master class on half dose antagonist. That will help you. Okay. And that is something which will really, really help you. Trust me. So if that is a situation which you are facing, just go through that master class. It will help you sort out your life better. I do not give any injectable progesterones at all in natural intercourse cycle, it is really cumbersome and painful to the patient. It should be a good experience, you know. It should not be a bad experience for that patient. Okay, that, oh, you took 15 days of injectable progesterone. It's really not recommended. There is no role of giving low molecular weight heparin in any of these patients. In fact, these patients are the happiest when they are free of injections. Okay. They are good. They are good to take that, you know, single trigger shot because most of the Google is full about this trigger shot. So they are happy taking that. All right. But apart from that, people don't really like to take injections is what I think. Okay. I think you have to travel back. We'll take the rest of the questions uh, on uh, groups. So thank you. Very yeah, I'll answer just two questions, which I think are important. How to manage pre, uh, premature ruptured follicle? I already discussed this, guys. Just go through this entire session again. You will really uh, be benefited. Progesterone gel, Gita Madam, I have a standardized dose. It is to be given twice in a day for the next 14 days. Okay. And if the endometrium is hyper echogenic in your follicular phase. Okay. That's a common question which people ask. That is because of an incorrect stimulation. Okay. The trigger will always cause rupture. It is going to be foolish. If you end up checking for rupture all the time, okay, by that logic, you should do every hourly scan after you give after you give the trigger to identify rupture. All right. So don't go into those type of practices. Yes, you can use dofastone absolutely fine. Okay, you can absolutely use dofastone. It's a great molecule to use. It is really, really up to you. Okay. I have described what I use. If you want to use dofastone, it is simple. You give 10 milligram TDS, don't give 10 milligram BD. Okay. Just give 10 milligram TDS as a standard dose if you want to use dofastone. And I don't really want to argue on why TDS and why not OD. Okay. You can simply Google it and the answers are very, very straightforward. Okay. So I hope, uh, I hope uh, this much information is sufficient. Okay, Bye. we can have the rest of the questions on uh, on WhatsApp. Uh, I shall respond by tomorrow morning because I'll be driving back to Bombay. And I hope all of you found this class.